what I'm going to be talking about, um, the advertised description was drugs, body parts, and socialized medicine. I don't want anyone to accuse me of fraud, but I want to raise one other topic very briefly, and that is the case of Nestle breast milk substitutes. Nestle, the company that makes chocolate, makes other things as well. One of the things they made was a breast milk substitute, and they marketed this in Africa, and they were <coughs> roundly excoriated by all progressives and all you know, good liberal types. And there was some sort of tragedy going on, because what happened was uh, a lot of these women in Africa were very poor, and they started in with this, and when you start in with the breast milk substitute, the breast milk in your breast dries up, and it's not available for the baby anymore. And what happened was because of the dirty water that they had to mix with the powder, uh, it didn't work, and the babies got sick, and then when they wanted to return to their breasts, they weren't able to, and there were babies that died needlessly. <laughs> And for this, as I say, uh, the company was uh, roundly condemned, uh, profit, uh, profiteering, uh, greed, you know, the usual. But it's interesting to me that what really, uh, in the U.S. or in Canada or in Western Europe or in Japan, these things work fine because we have clean water. It's interesting to me that the media would blame the capitalist and not the government which is responsible for the dirty water. I mean, here it's the government in, is responsible for the water supply. If they would have privatized it and there was no clean water, well, then maybe you could blame the private people who are providing dirty water. But here it's the, the bloody government that's doing it, and yet they uh, are not blamed at all. So there's a certain bias, I think, uh, in, in these sorts of things. Bias against markets, bias against capitalism, bias against uh, freedom. Okay, let me now get into drugs. Hey, you want to buy... No, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm not trying to sell drugs here. I'm not even promoting drugs. Actually, I oppose recreational drugs such as uh, heroin, marijuana, cocaine, things like that. I'm talking about the legalization. Just because I oppose it doesn't mean that I have to favor uh, prohibition. Or just because I favor legalization doesn't mean I have to advocate the actual use of it's not a logical incompatibility, it's not a logical inconsistency to say on the one hand we ought to legalize things, decriminalize them, not put, put people in jail for selling or buying them, and on the other hand say I personally don't use it, I wouldn't want my kids to use it, I don't recommend it to you to use it, I think it's a way to rot your brain, and yet I think we should not put people in jail for doing things that I think are foolish. It's not a logical incompatibility, and I, th I think it's a, a perfectly coherent position. It's the position that I hold. You have to distinguish between libertarianism and libertinism. Libertarianism just says no one should go to jail for engaging in voluntary consensual libertine acts. Libertinism says go, uh, do weird, perverse drug, sex, whatever. That's good. I'm not a libertine. I'm a libertarian. And even though the two are spelled almost the same and sound almost the same, there's a world of difference between them. I wrote an article in the Journal of Libertarian Studies on just that topic. I forget what the title is, something like Libertinism versus Libertarianism. Okay, I also have the same view with regard to cigarettes and alcohol. Uh, alcohol in, in anything but great moderation. These things are bad for you. Uh, I don't use it. I, I don't do much of that stuff, personally but I still think that those things should not be prohibited. Okay, secondly, uh, the legalization is for adults only. If you start selling drugs to kids, I think it should be uh, a crime, because kids are different. The libertarian vision is for consenting adults, not for consenting kids. Kids are the sort of being who can't give consent. <laughs> A third point, uh, again, uh, and an analog between drugs on the one hand and alcohol on the other, right now we have laws against uh, driving while under the influence of alcohol. Now, there are some questions about this, mainly because it's government roads, but forget about that problem. I think in a private road system, I predict, as a, as a theoretician, not as an entrepreneur, that most private road owners would prohibit driving while drunk. Well, similarly, uh, they would prohibit <coughs> driving while drugged. 
So the idea is that you would treat drugs, uh, uh, um, these uh, kinds of drugs, and alcohol on, on, on a par. Okay, so that's the case that I'll try to defend, and I'll try to defend it on two grounds. Uh, the first is the economic, and the usual defense on economic grounds for all trade is that there are ex ante gains from trade. If I trade you my wristwatch for your pen, it must be that you value the wristwatch more than the pen, and it must be that I value the pen more than the wristwatch, so we each gain in the ex ante sense. Not necessarily in the ex post sense, afterward we might regret it, but in the ex ante sense, all trade is mutually beneficial. Well, it's the same thing with uh, I buy uh, an ounce of cocaine for 100 bucks. I value the cocaine more than the 100 bucks. The seller values the 100 bucks more than the cocaine. And again, there's mutual benefit. There are some people who are very exercised about this. A guy, Dan Klein, who's a libertarian Austrian, just came out with an article saying that uh, attacking Rothbard and myself for saying this sort of a thing. I'm not sure I understand his logic, but not everyone agrees is the point I'm making. Okay, uh, another economic point is that we assume away the objections of third parties. Uh, suppose, to get back to this pen versus uh, wristwatch, suppose that there's some person here, who can I pick? Don isn't here. Uh, uh, what's your name? Josh. Josh. Josh objects to me trading this pen with the watch with some people. Don't we have to take his objection into account? No, he's not part of the market. The market now consists just of the pen holder and the wristwatch holder. Josh is a third party. He could be a Marxist who opposes all trade. Well, similarly, there are people who oppose uh, trade in uh, drugs. But we don't take into account their loss of utility because they can't demonstrate it. Maybe they're lying. but uh, I mean, there's a difference between people who are actually trading and therefore demonstrating that they benefit or lose from these things. Now, it need not be that you benefit or lose from these things. It might be that the only reason you're willing to trade your pen for my watch is you think I'll give you a good mark in this class. But I'm not marking you. You'd be very foolish to think that. So we can have different motivations for doing this. All we know is that for some reason you prefer this watch and you're willing to give up your pen. Another problem is that these drug laws are very ineffective. In prisons, where, you, where the warden presumably has total control over the inmates, they still have drugs in prisons. So if they have drugs in prisons where there's total control, how, it, how in bloody blue blazes are they going to stop it out here in ordinary society where we still have some freedoms, more than, at least more than prisoners do? Okay, a second case for legalization is philosophical. The ownership of the self. We each own our own bodies. Feminists say a woman owns her own body. Well, men too. We all own our own bodies. Well, if we own our own bodies, then we should have the right to put into our bodies whatever we please. And a law that says we can't put certain things into our body is a violation of our sanctity of, of our bodies. It's really a partial slavery. All slavery is, is a total control of our bodies against our will. I'm not talking about voluntary slavery now. I'm talking the, the good old-fashioned kind of slavery. Well, every time that there's an interference with what we can do with our bodies, it's partial slavery. One of the things I like about New Orleans is that the motorcycle people can drive around without helmets. In Canada, not only can't motorcyclists drive around without helmets, even people on bicycles have to have helmets now. If you don't have a helmet on a bicycle, they'll arrest you. At this rate, eventually, joggers and people going out for a walk will have to wear a helmet. Well, that's slavery, a partial slavery. And that's what drug prohibition is. Drugs are a victimless crime. There's no victim here. Yes, there are people who suffer from drugs, but there are people who suffer from alcohol or you know, eating too many uh, candy bars. Okay, I've made the case briefly. Now let me consider some objections to it. First of all, um, prohibition of drugs prevents physical harm to the user. Addiction is debilitating. So we will come along, the state, and, and for your own good, public health, whatever, for your own good, we're going to make sure that you behave yourself. Well, this is paternalism. Forcing adults to act, responsible, uh, to act responsible is totalitarian. What are we going to do next? Make sure that you brush your teeth? 
or floss or something, you know, have the government follow you around, you know, did you brush your teeth, did you wash behind your ears? I mean, this is okay if you're six years old or if you're four years old and you don't want to brush your teeth and your parents say you have to brush your teeth, okay. I'm paternalist enough with regard to children, but we're adults. This is also incompatible with the whole democratic ethos. If you're smart enough to vote, aren't you smart enough to decide what to put into your body? And if you're not smart enough to, put, to decide what to put into your body, how do you get to be smart enough to, to deserve to vote? So there's a little incompatibility between democracy and drug prohibition. And if you favor democracy, it's logically incompatible or inconsistent of you to uh, take the other position. Then there are all sorts of reductios ad absurdum. Other things are harmful too. And if you're going to prohibit something on the ground that it's harmful, then I have a list here that also harmful and should be prohibited is chocolate, ice cream, hang gliding, bungee jumping, ice skating, skiing, boxing, french fries, auto racing, car driving, test piloting, mining, alcohol, cigarettes, gambling, suicide. Suicide is harmful. Maybe we should prohibit that. Actually, there are all laws against it. In the good old days, the, the, you know what the penalty was for an attempted suicide? The death penalty? <laughs> so, so if you tried but failed, they would help you. I mean, that's sort of the, the ultimate in uh, paternalism. Uh, the scare of addiction is overrated, according to some people who claim to know something about it. And it's hard to know because once it's prohibited, you don't have good data on it. Um, only uh, one or two percent of the population uses it regularly enough to be considered addicted and another um, two or three percent use it regularly but are not addicted. Uh, the, the various uh, estimators differ in their estimations. Okay, another um, objection is that there's financial harm to others when you use drugs and therefore we should prohibit drugs because other people lose. Well, one argument is that the state has to take care of uh, drug addicts. They're a danger to the group, therefore the group is justified in stopping the individual. The idea here is that if you take drugs, you debilitate yourself. If you debilitate yourself, you uh, then avail yourself of the public treasury with regard to health care or what have you. And therefore, we should stop you from debilitating yourself in the first place so that we don't have to pay for your illness. Well, there's an easy answer to that. Get rid of socialized medicine. Get rid of this idea that we're responsible for each other on a coercive basis, and then you're free to do what you want. Also, this applies to alcohol, chocolate, cigarettes, cookies. You know, if you're overweight, then you'll avail yourself of the medicine, the socialized medicine. Therefore, we should stop you from being overweight in the first place. Th that would apply. Another one, uh, this is really preventive detention. Because you might possibly be a burden on us, we're going to stop you beforehand. This is preventive detention, and on that basis, what we ought to do is put all uh, male teenagers between, say, 14 and 19 into jail and let them out when they're 20 on the grounds that the uh, males from 14 to 19 contributed disproportionate amount of crime. But, you know, this is obviously nonsense, and yet it's the same logic with drugs. Another one is that the drug breadwinner won't support his family. Well, the alcoholic drug, the, the alcoholic uh, breadwinner won't support his family either, so should we go back to the prohibition of alcohol? And also, if they are legally responsible, then jail them for non-payment. Don't jail them for uh, alcohol or drugs. Okay, here's another objection, and this is perhaps one of the most serious objections that many people will launch at my case here for legalization, and that is that addictive drugs promote crime. Well, the Harrison Narcotics Act of 1917, which started all this stuff off, uh, had nothing to do with crime. What it had to do with was racism, anti-Chinese racism. For some reason, we decided that Chinese were evil and uh, the yellow menace and this, that, and the other. We also, as a society, noticed that they went to opium dens. And therefore, we figured, well, they like it, so we have to prohibit it. But opium dens didn't make you criminals. I mean, the, the Chinese people didn't come out of opium dens with knives and start stabbing people. The opium dens sort of made you sleepy. So it was almost the opposite. They weren't committing crimes at all. Uh, crack and uh, PCBs do 
get you uh, hopped up. Uh, in my article on, on this subject, I, call, I talk about this thing called the Godzilla pill. I say, well, suppose it was true. Suppose that you take a drug and you start going berserk, or you become a vampire or whatever. We got a lot of that in New Orleans, you know, so you've got to watch out for that stuff. Well, if this were true, should we prohibit it? Should we prohibit the Godzilla pill? The libertarian would say, well, you prohibit things that, uh, that are per se invasions of, uh, violent invasions of people or, or their property. Should we have laws against murder? You're darn tootin'. Murder is per se an invasion. Should we have laws against rape and, and theft? Sure. Well, how about just taking a pill that in five minutes will make me go out and rape and murder and kill? Well, no. Because taking the pill is not per se an invasive act. What the cops ought to do is uh, look very carefully at people who take these pills. And uh, as the, you know, the hair starts growing and the fangs start uh, whatever, and, and they, they start going like this, then you shoot them. <laughs> because then they're an active threat. Because you know they're going to you know, start clawing at people or whatever it is. But the act of taking of a pill is a non-invasive act. So even if there were a Godzilla pill or a vampire pill, which there isn't, uh, we still shouldn't prohibit it. Uh, then there's also the potency effect. When you uh, prohibit things, what you do is the, the black market gets into more and more potent things. Instead of marijuana, people go into cocaine. Instead of cocaine, they go into um, uh, crack or uh, heroin or whatever. The reason is that uh, marijuana is cheaper than cocaine. So to get the same profit, you could just have a kilo of cocaine where it would take a ton of marijuana. Uh, when we had um, prohibition of alcohol, instead of beer, you went to wine or liquor. If they one day prohibited Coca-Cola or soft drinks like that, instead of having Diet Coke, we'd have Jolt, the potency effect. You know, you get more heavy, serious stuff. The actual cause of crime is not the drugs, but the prohibition of drugs. First of all, sellers and buyers per se become criminals. Secondly, there's theft due to the increased cost. Now, the economics of this is that most of these things are weeds. Marijuana is like a weed. It grows. It's a very hardy weed. It's not like asparagus or something that, that would be an expensive sort of a thing. And if it were legal, the supply curve would be way out here to the right, indicating a very low price. But because it's prohibited, the supply is very much up to the left, and the price is very high. Now, there are various estimates. You druggies know what the price is. What, what does it cost you for a habit for a week? Uh, well, according to my estimates, somebody estimates 1000 a week. Others say it's 4000 a week, 500 a week. Whereas if it were legal and it was a weed, I mean, it just takes cigarettes. Tobacco is sort of a hardy weed, too. Most of the um, price of a cigarette is tax. Without that tax, uh, a week, uh, you know, a pack a day kind of a habit of uh, cigarettes might be, I don't know, 15, 20 bucks. So you're talking maybe $20 here versus a thousand dollars there and to get a thousand dollars a week or two thousand a week depending upon supply and, and competitiveness and rivalrousness most people have to commit crimes to get that or have to engage in prostitution or other <coughs> kinds of things like that whereas if the cost was twenty bucks a week is anyone gonna kill or rob or maim to you know buy paper clips or something I mean the whole thing is silly so the cause of the crime is not the drug, it's the prohibition of the drug. Then there's the mushrooms. What's a mushroom? We even have a word for this. A mushroom is an innocent person who gets killed in a shootout between gangs who are uh, wanting this good street corner. We even have a word for, you know, a little three-year-old girl gets killed because the, the gangs are shooting at each other over turf. Then there are innocents killed by trigger-happy police. And it's understandable why they would be trigger happy, because the people that, dealing, that they're dealing with are very dangerous. And there are police deaths. Um, and they say that 50% of prisoners are uh, in prison now are in prison because of drugs, which is uh, a horrendous sort of a thing.
Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, this so-called argument about legitimacy, that if we legalize it, we're giving it our imprimatur. We're sort of saying it's okay. Um, the government is now approving of it, therefore they're saying it's okay. Well, th this means that Bush and, and Kerry and people like that are our role models, and if they legalize it, they're sort of giving it their imprimatur. Since when do people do what they say? I mean, why are they our role models? There are plenty of things that are not, plenty of bad things that are not illegal. You should not confuse that which is good with that which is legal. Okay, the next argument, the next objection, uh, is the zombiehood argument. The idea is that if we legalize it, everyone's going to sort of walk around like a zombie like this. They're, they're drugged, and you've seen all those movies. Uh, I usually, when I'm trying to uh, jazz up the elasticity concept for my freshman students. What I use is the drug case. Let me try this on you. Uh, how many people favor uh, the present system of prohibition of drugs? How many people favor legalization? This example isn't going to work too well <laughs> with this group. Usually what I'll get is maybe, oh, out of a, a class of, I don't know, how many people, 50, 60 people here, you get maybe two or three libertarians who raise their hand and say it should be legalized. And virtually everyone else says it shouldn't be. And then what I do is I draw the following diagram. I say, here is $1,000 a habit. Here is uh, $10 a habit. And here are three demand curves. Right now, I say to people, the demand is such that 2% of the population uh, uses drugs, okay? And uh, that's at this price. And if we go down to this price, we can have uh, various possibilities. One demand curve, a very inelastic one, would get you to 3%. A moderate one would get you to, I use 7% of the population. And then uh, I say 25%. And now I say to the class, here are three options, uh, A, B, and C. How many people would favor legalization if only 3% of the people became addicted at the lower price? And I get a, a, quite a few. And then I say, how many at this? Fewer. And over here, virtually no one raises their hand. It's just a way of uh, illustrating what elasticity is. What I want to do now is to give you arguments, because you people will be facing students like this, give you arguments to indicate that the, the curve is more likely to be A than it is to be C. Namely, it's inelastic. Not that this is relevant for principled libertarianism, but that it might convince some people, these sorts of empirical things sometimes convince some people, and it's part of the case. Okay, first, necessities have a lower elasticity than luxuries, and drugs are a textbook case of necessities, therefore a low elasticity. So that's one bit of evidence why the demand curve would be more vertical than flatter. Second one is, if it was legal, there'd be no pushing. Nobody comes to a schoolyard and says, hey kid, you want to buy a chocolate bar? And they open up their jacket and show a chocolate bar, because it's legal. Whereas with drugs, people try to hook new people. The potency would be down. We, would, we were talking about that. Then you have various cases. In Mexico, it's de jure prohibited, but de facto it's legal. And yet, all of Mexico isn't uh, drug addicted. In the Netherlands, it's de jure legalized, and the Dutch are not all on drugs. The UK case was uh, interesting, because there it seems to be a counterexample. What they did is they uh, calculated how many drug addicts they had, and then what they did is they didn't legalize it, but th they allowed their health, socialized health practices to give people heroin who, who were addicted. And they found that there was a gigantic increase in the number of addicts. Uh, I don't know if it was like uh, the C, but maybe it was like the B, a very big increase. But there are problems with this experiment, and there are problems with this objection. One of the problems is there was probably a serious undercounting of drug addicts beforehand. They came out of the woodwork 
after it was legal and they could get free heroin at the, uh, at the doctor's office, many more addicts uh, eventuated than they thought they had. Secondly, people came from all over the British dominions, India, Canada, wherever it was. This was in the 50s or the 60s, this case. So it's not that new addicts were created, it's that new addicts in England were created because they came from, from other countries. The real danger was Coca-Cola in 1917. You know what Coca-Cola had? Cocaine. So if you're going to ban anything, I suppose you should be banning that. Another argument for the elasticity is there are very few people who say, well, you know, I'd really like to do hard drugs, but they're so expensive. You know, th that would be the, the elasticity demand curve speaking. Okay, so the case for re-legalization, to go back to the status quo ante before 1917, is that crime would fall drastically, and there would be health care gains. What are the health care gains, uh, the public health? Well, first of all, AIDS would be reduced because you wouldn't have to share needles. Look, imagine if we banned insulin for diabetics, and now they have to share needles and they have to commit crimes to get their insulin. That would be a horror. A horror. But uh, the, the two cases are analogous. And if we're going to legalize insulin, or rather we're gonna, if we're going to legalize, we have in, legalized insulin, we should also legalize heroin because the, the two are parallel. Lenny Bruce, one of my favorite people, a semi-quasi-libertarian, certainly on some issues, died not of a heroin o overdose, but of impure heroin. Just as people during alcohol prohibition would die of bathtub gin because quality isn't good when you don't have brand names and you don't have advertising, you have fly-by-night bathtub gin makers who put poison in that stuff. Well, so is it true that when you have black markets making heroin, you get impurities. If this stuff was legalized and Pfizer and SmithKline and other big pharmaceutical giants were giving heroin, selling heroin, you'd know that the quality of heroin was whatever it said on the package. Whereas now you, you get it and you don't know what you're getting. Poor Lenny Bruce died of uh, uh, impure heroin. Civil liberties, it's the right of adults to do as we wish. The drug war is virtually unwinnable. As I said before, they can't win it in prisons. But there's an economic reason why they can't win it also. There was this uh, case in... Um, Greek mythology where there were two gods fighting and one god uh, he was the son of the earth and every time he was knocked down the two gods were equally matched so one would be knocked down the other would be knocked down but every time god number A was knocked down his mother would sort of perk him up with energy and he'd rise more strong well who's who's gonna win that kind of a war obviously the, the one with that advantage well similarly every time the uh, Bureau of Drug Enforcement or whatever they're called, DEA, wins. And they uh, take, they capture two tons of heroin. What happens to the supply curve to the market? Shifts to the left or the right? To the left. What happens to prices and profits in drug uh, provision? Goes up. So every success that they have encourages it. So how can you win a war where every success you have uh, encourages the other guy. It's sort of like the God B. Every time he knocks down his enemy, his enemy comes up stronger. No way you're going to win that kind of a fight. So the war on drugs is unwinnable. We ought to declare victory, as they say, and, uh, you know, stop fighting. Okay, well that's pretty much it for the case on drugs. Uh, now let me talk about body parts markets and body parts, which most audiences, you know, they sort of recoil in horror. You know, how can you have uh, markets and body parts? It's horrible. Uh, it's ghoulish. And you have these um, movies and TV shows where people grab each other's kidneys and sort of sell them. And, you know, it's just the horror of all horrors. You know, it's sort of capitalism uh, exposed. Well, the economics of it are that at present, and this is just with regard to kidneys, but there are other organs out there. The situation is, here is the supply, here is the demand, the quantity, the price. Um, 
80,000 people per year need kidneys, otherwise they'll die. 20,000 are forthcoming as a result of our present system. Therefore, some 60,000 people die for lack of kidneys. And this is multiplied by the other organs. This is sort of the economist horror story. On the one hand, you have people going into the grave who are lacking something. And if they had it, they wouldn't be dying way before their time. On the other hand, there are also people going into the grave with perfectly good kidneys that could have been transferred, would have been transferred, but for the fact that you have a price control of zero. And yet they're not transferred. This is the sort of the ultimate essence of misallocation of resources. Trades that could have taken place but don't take place with very dire consequences. 60,000 people a year die as a result of this. Uh, I forgot to say one thing about drugs. Um, th there's one argument in favor of drug legalization that I'm against. Some people say, well, one, another advantage of drug legalization is that when it's legalized, the government can tax it and the government can have more money. As far as I'm concerned, this is the only good argument against legalization <laughs> because the government already has too much money. <laughs> we don't want them to have more money. And if that was the only effect of legalization, I'd be sorely tempted to say we shouldn't legalize. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I should have said that. I don't know why I, I missed up. But, you know, <coughs> you get imperfect lecturers around here. Uh, in any case, another, uh, what it reminded me of is the silver lining business. What is the silver lining here? There is a silver lining. The silver lining is that you get a lot of TV shows that are based on, on this problem. You, know, you get some little girl, 13 years old, who needs a kidney and is uh, about to die. And you see her getting worse, the worst makeup every uh, 10 minutes. And uh, they're racing around trying to get her one, and she's on the list. But now uh, there's some glitch. So one good thing of the present system of uh, prohibition of body part markets is you have more drama and more TVs and more uh, movies that, that are based on this. And, and if we legalize that, we wouldn't have that, that opening. So there's a silver lining. It's very ghoulish because the favorite weekends for people on kidney dialysis machines are Memorial Day and the 4th of July. Why? Because you get a lot of deaths there. And you get a lot of deaths, not of people my age whose kidneys are a little wonky, <laughs> but people your age on motorcycles, which are called donor mobiles. You get people who are 22 who get smacked up and let's say their head is gone, but their kidneys are fine. And they've got all sorts of great organs ready to go. And these people are just sort of waiting by the TV, hoping for more deaths. You know, talk about weird kinds of uh, emotional responses. I mean, that's the result of prohibition of this particular market. Let me take a survey of you people. How many of you have already signed that thing on your, mo on your license plate, uh, on, on your license permit, which says that if you die, uh, they don't have to ask permission. They can come and take your organs. You're an organ donor. Will you people stop ruining all my examples? <laughs> this is a horrible audience. I mean, about two-thirds of you have already done that. See, in most classes, what I do... <laughs> I'm, I'm now trying to draw a supply curve, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to ignore you people because you're pathetic. I mean, you're, you're just very uncooperative. I'm going to report you to Lou, and he's going to deal with you people. <laughs> Here's the quantity. Here's the price. In most cases, what, what we're now trying to do is draw a supply curve. And a supply curve shows a locus of points indicating different prices and different quantities forthcoming. In most groups of about 60 people, you'll get about five with a dot right there. So this means five people are willing to offer their organs for free. Here it's two-thirds of you. And then what I do is I say, well, suppose I offered you, this is zero, suppose I offered you 100 bucks, how many people would now uh, offer their organs? And I'll get another five. And then I say, how about 200 bucks? And, uh, you know, maybe another three. And how about 500 bucks? And uh, maybe I'll get one more, maybe no more. And then I have to escalate. And I say, well, how about 10,000 bucks? This doesn't mean we're going to take your organs. <laughs> it just means that you're signing a contract such that 
if you die, we own your organs, we, whoever we are. Uh, the government now, but in, in the private market, would be uh, intermediaries in the organ market system. And now you'll get more of a supply curve. So you get some sort of supply curve like that. The problem is, right now, uh, unless you've signed these organ cards, and even now, even if you sign them, somehow the law is such that uh, we still have to get parental permission. It, it's complicated there. But in all too many cases, when you haven't signed these things, the hospital comes to the parent, just as their 23-year-old kid died and they heard about it two hours ago, and they say, hey, we'd like to take all the organs. I mean, the, think of the parents. They're just crying because, you know, this little baby, they used a diaper and they brought up and they loved and now it's <laughs> dead. And, and they're going to take stuff out of, his, out of his chest and stuff. And very few people are willing to do that. That's why you have a shortage of organs. If we had a market, we would then uh, have some sort of supply and demand, and presumably, I don't know what the price would be, let's say 500 bucks, and now there would be no shortage of organs. There'd be none of this, some people going to the grave for lack of, what other people going to the grave have, but never the train shall meet. The whole problem would end. So, in addition to being a principal libertarian position, namely contract to be able to sell organs. This has great utilitarian effects, that namely millions of lives will be saved or hundreds of thousands of lives will be saved. There was this case in Canada where a four-year-old boy needed a liver and his father put an ad in the paper or on eBay or somewhere, wanted one liver, willing to pay a quarter of a million dollars. And you know what happened to this father? They put him in jail. I mean, <laughs> you put a guy in jail for trying to save his little baby boy? That's the kind of a society we have. That's the kind of a society we have when we prohibit markets. It's just a horror, horror situation. Now, there is one objection, and the objection is that if we legalize this and we have $500, then we will unleash people who will grab people and uh, put them unconscious and take their organs out of them. You get what I'm saying? Uh, organ thieves? But the economics of this are all wrong. Because right now, at, at this point, the, the legal point, how many organs are there? There are this many organs. You get the point? Right now, this is how many organs we've got. The number that are voluntarily agreed upon. Well, this qu quantity intersects the demand curve at a way higher price. Say it's uh, 100,000. So if there is any impetus to grab people's organs, presumably it will be in proportion to the price of the organ because the, the, the better the price, the, the more profit to be made out of it. So paradoxically, the present system will have much more of this organ napping then will a free enterprise system, namely because the price will be lower. So here is the free enterprise price. Here is the present prohibited price. So if anyone gives you this argument that says that if we legalize, you'll unleash organ nappers, the very opposite of that is true. Namely, right now there are more incentives for organ napping than there would be under free enterprise. And similarly, you know, poor people have to have to give up their organs, what have you. Okay, the third topic I want to raise with you is socialized medicine. What's going on with socialized medicine? What's going on with socialized medicine is the argument that, okay, look, I favor free enterprise. I'm a free enterpriser. Remember we, we said that there were these people that favored free enterprise except in this or except in that? Well, here are people who say, yes, count me in, I favor capitalism, markets, laissez-faire, great. However, there's one area where you can't have it, and that's health, medical service. Because, you know, medical service is unique, and medical service is this, and medical service is that. And I'm here to say that medical service, along with everything else, follows economic logic, follows economic law, and there's no difference between medical service and anything else. It's the same sort of an argument. If we have markets, 
we have rational prices, we have profit and loss, we have incentives all set up so that the invisible hand works. If we don't, we have socialist calculational uh, chaos, and we have lack of incentives, and we have horror stories. Okay, so what are the specifics? One uh, specific is making money off of sickness is bad. And if we had a free market system in healthcare, people would make money off of other people's misery. And, you know, th that's unkosher, that's evil, that's bad. You, you shouldn't be making money off of the misery of other people. But medicine isn't unique in, in that. People who provide food are taking advantage of people's starvation. People who provide clothing in the market are taking advantage of people's nakedness. In every case, whenever you people who provide these pens are taking advantage of the absence of pens on the part of people who buy them. That, so medicine is not unique. In every case, whenever you sell anything, you're profiting off of the misery of others. How are you profiting off the misery of others? By supplying these others with what they're miserable about not having. So, you know, what's so wrong about that? But the point here is that medicine is not different than anything else. Now, I hate to violate the, what is it, the uh, paradox of value? What, what's the, the diamond's water paradox? You know the, the old diamond's water paradox. Why is it that diamonds are worth so much, and yet if all the diamonds in the world disappeared, uh, we would be as we were pretty much. Maybe, you know, diamonds are supposed to be a girl's best friend, but what the heck? Whereas if all the water in the world disappeared, we'd all die within uh, a day or two. So why is it that diamonds, which are not really worth much, are so valuable, and water, which is worth everything, is worth nothing? The diamonds water paradox. The solution, of course, is the marginalist insight that we never buy or sell all diamonds or all water. Rather, we, we deal with this much water, given all the other water around, versus a, a cup, half cup full of diamonds, <laughs> given all the other diamonds that are around. Well, I've got it, I might as well slurp some. So I don't want to say, I don't want to get, well, I guess I do want to violate that a little bit by saying that there are things that are more important than medical care. For example, if we didn't have medical care, how long would we live without medical care? Suppose all doctors were banished, you couldn't, or all the knowledge of medicine were, were lost. Would we all die tomorrow? No. Old people would die sooner. People your age, are, you know, you're, you're healthy. You're, you're not going to be even getting sick for, for many years. Whereas if all food vanished tomorrow, we would, you know, be in big trouble. In two or three days, we'd be, all be dead. So if there's any case for socializing anything, it's for food, not medical practice. So what I've done now is I've violated the diamond's water paradox, but I'm sort of acknowledging that I'm doing it, and I'm doing it in the full knowledge that it's not exactly right, that we never choose between all health care and all food or all anything. But I'm saying if you want to take these people at their own pace, then you have to use arguments of this sort. So uh, food, clothing, and shelter are more important than uh, health care if you want to take all of anything. So if there's a case for socializing anything, it's a case for these things, not he health care. Then there's the argument health care is too important to leave to the market. It's okay for rubber bands and paper clips and luxuries, but for important things you have to have the government. Well, I would say the opposite is true, that if you have to have socialism, let's have it for paper clips. Okay, it'll screw up the paper clip industry, but what the heck, you know, you, you, life will go on. So it's the very opposite of what these people are saying. See, I'm a moderate. I'm willing to, you know, if we, if we can have full laissez-faire capitalism, I'll give those guys the paperclip industry. The next one is that capitalist doctors are only in it for the money. Well, intentions are irrelevant. Adam Smith tells us it's, it's not from benevolence that the butcher and the baker and the candlestick maker give us their wares. It's out of self-interest. So what's wrong with self-interest motivating a good health industry? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. What's so good about good intentions? Okay, I'm not against good intentions, but good intentions aren't enough. We need more. 
let me talk just a little bit about sociobiology and, and answer the question about why it is that people are so biased in favor of socialism. Sociobiology is the theory that we are the way we are because of what it meant to survive a million years ago. Why, when a baby cries, do we cringe and, and are ready to do something? Well, imagine two societies living a million years ago. One, when the baby cried, they moved heaven and earth to help the baby. And the other, the baby cries, and said, eh, who cares? Well, what's going to happen in this society? <laughs> They're not going to survive? Right? Because if they don't take care of babies, you don't have much of a society. Uh, what about, um, I don't know, if, if men are not interested in women of about 22, whereas in this society they are. Well, what's going to happen in this society? They're not going to procreate. We're not going to have this society. We descend from this society because we know that because we're here. Take this, um, uh, another case. Well, l let me get back to this now. In those societies of 100,000 years ago, we lived in groups of 20 or 30, 50, not in groups of 300 million, right? The caveman, okay? And in those societies, there, there are now two kinds of cooperation. There's explicit cooperation, where, you know, you scratch my back, I scratch yours, uh, I can't reach this uh, berry, and I boost you up, and you grab the berry, and we share it. That's explicit cooperation. Implicit cooperation is markets. Did we have markets in groups of 20 or 30? No, you don't need markets. Even Mises uh, would say you don't really need markets. Explicit cooperation is good when you have a group of 10, 20, or 30. So we are hardwired in our cerebellum or somewhere to appreciate explicit cooperation, but not implicit cooperation. Implicit cooperation occurred when we had markets, and that's something of 10,000 years ago. I'm not sure of the exact date, but it's way too late in our biological development to get in our gut or in our hardwiring genetic code. So my explanation as to why every time I get a new freshman economics class, they're filled with all of this stuff about how markets are evil and how governments are great, it's because they're hardwired to, do, to be that way. And the only way you can overcome this general tendency or bias against markets is through education or through lifting yourself up by your bootstraps or what have you. So the reason that socialized medicine uh, it re resonates among the, the populace is because they're hardwired for that. Now the usual objection to the sociobiological explanation of anything is, well, how do you account for the um, Declaration of Independence and the economic freedom and the laissez-faire capitalism that we had? And my answer is that you don't have to account for that. That, looking back over history, over all of history, was, you know, one millionth of one percent of human action. It was just an aberration. The uh, basic premise, unless we get smart as a species, is socialism. That's why so few people are here. That's why uh, Mises didn't get the Nobel Prize. That's why um, all of this other stuff, because people don't appreciate that. They're hardwired in the opposite direction. Okay, let me get back onto, onto this. One of the things that resonates, and you hear Kerry babbling about this all the time, 40 million Americans don't have health insurance. 40 million Americans don't have health insurance. 40, you know, just on and on and on, and this is the, the worst horror. Well, they don't have food insurance either. They don't have clothing insurance. The problem is that health care is so bloody expensive. If health care were like food, relatively cheap, or clothing, relatively cheap, because we have free enterprise there, then we wouldn't need health insurance. It wouldn't be the horror that it is. So a big part of my case for free markets in health care is to show why socialism is making medical care so expensive and how capitalism would make it so cheap, relatively, that you wouldn't have to worry about people being not insured because nobody would be insured, because it would be like you know food. No one has food insurance. Okay, so what are the problems with socialized medicine? One of them is that socialized medicine destroys the price system. If the government does it, you don't have markets determining prices. With no free prices, you can't have e rational, economic plan uh, rational e uh, economics. 
Prices are to the economy as road signs and maps are to the geography. And if you don't have road signs and maps, you get lost. If you don't have prices, you get lost in the economy. You don't know. You can't know whether to hire an extra doctor or install another machine or train another nurse or buy an MRI. There's no way to rationally allocate anything. It's the same problem that the Soviets faced for their entire economy. Should we allocate money for cure or for prevention? And in what proportion? None of these questions emanate from the market anymore. All of them have to be made bureaucratically. The allocation of resources is kaput, just like in the US, uh, USSR. <laughs> According to the statistics, which I think are reliable, 50% of the expenses in medical care are made in the last six months of our lives. Is this rational? Is this the way we would do it if, if we had markets? Probably not. And yet the bureaucratic impetus pushes us in this direction. There are long queues and waiting lists under socialized medicine. And it's easy to see why there would be long queues in socialized medicine, because if the price is zero, if the price is zero based on just basic supply and demand, if the price is zero, you're going to have a, a long waiting list or a long queue, because that's what we mean by a shortage. That's what a shortage is. The reason we have shortages is we push prices down below equilibrium, and of course you'll get a shortage. Let me read to you a letter that comes from someone in Canada. My sister and her husband own and operate a cattle ranch in southwest Saskatchewan. On this ranch they have several saddle horses. About three years ago one of her horses became ill and was in obvious distress. She took it to the nearest vet clinic where it was diagnosed with gallstones, apparently a very painful condition for horses as well as people. The vet recommended that the horse be operated on as soon as possible. My sister left the animal with the vet who operated him on that night. My sister picked up the horse four days later and took it home. After a couple of weeks of rest, the horse was as good as new. Fine. At about the same time, my sister's friend in the city of Saskatoon was also diagnosed with gallstones and the doctor recommended that she be operated on as soon as possible. There's one glitch in this. As soon as possible in Saskatchewan's Medicare system, socialized medicine, the, the vaunted Canadian system, means 18 months. <laughs> so this 35-year-old mother of one had to put her life on hold, endure several trips to the emergency room whenever she had an attack. She could not afford the ambulance, not covered by Medicare, so she had to take a cab every time she had one. Then she sat in the emergency room for several hours until they gave her a bunch of powerful painkillers and sent her home. All this severely curtailed her enjoyment of life, as you can imagine, after 18 months of this she was operated on. My sister pointed out that if she had made her horse wait 18 months, she would have been found herself in front of a judge answering charges of cruelty, cruelty to animals, and rightfully so. No one would do that to an animal, but apparently it is acceptable to do this in humans in Canada. Now this is the, the much vaunted Canadian medical system that Kerry and, and uh, what's her name, um, Hillary, were uh, very hopped up about. We've got to have the Canadian system single, payer, whatever. Here are some waiting lists for various things in Canada. I get this from my old employer, the Fraser Institute. Orthopedics, 25 weeks. Plastic surgery, 19. Ophthalmology, 22.3 weeks. Gynecology, 13 weeks. Here's one I don't even know how to pronounce. Atalonogeny. I don't know what that means. I don't want to know what that means, but it's 14 weeks. Okay. Urology, 12 weeks. Neurosurgery, 17 weeks. General surgery, 9 weeks. Internal medicine, 6 weeks. Cardiovascular, 18 weeks. You have a heart problem, you wait 18 weeks. This is a problem. You know, I had a heart problem, I'd want to, you know, wait 18 minutes um, for service. There was this basketball player, Big Country Reeves. He played for the Vancouver basketball team when they were in Vancouver. He had an ankle problem. Guess what waiting list was there for him? Zero. He got his ankle treated the next day. Politicians, movie stars, people like that, and, and they yell about the two-tier system. It's evil. You know, the rich will get better service. Of course the rich get better service. What other point is there of being rich if you don't get better service? Okay. The, the big problem with medicine is that it's so expensive. If it were like peanut butter or fast food burgers, the problem would disappear. 
Now, even under laissez-faire capitalism, the prices won't come down to zero, but they'll, uh, it'll knock out a big part of the costs. How, why so? How so? Well, I divide this into supply and demand and one other concept, which I'll get to in a minute. Supply restrictions. We know that when supply shifts to the left, prices go up. The AMA, the American Medical Association, is a entity which specializes in shifting that supply curve to the left by restrictions on entry. Ron Hamaway wrote a book, um, Canadian Medicine, a Case Study in Restricted Entry, something like that. I forget the exact title. That, uh, whether it's in Canada or the United States or Great Britain or anywhere else, what the medical associations do is restrict entry, push those supply curves to the left compared to what they would otherwise be, and raise the prices of medicine. Labor costs are usually three quarters of the cost of anything on average. Doctors' salaries are a big part, not the whole thing, but a big part of medical care, and we have so few doctors compared to the doctors we'd have in a free society that their prices are very, very much higher. Okay, now at first glance, or the response from the AMA is, look, yes, we're restricting quantity, but the reason for restricting quantity is not to raise prices, God forbid. We don't want to raise prices of doctors. It's to increase quality. That's their ploy. We want to have Cadillac doctors. We don't want to have, um, you know, Volkswagen doctors or something like that. And this sounds reasonable. But let me ask you, would we be better served by our automobile industry than at present if all cars lower in quality than a Cadillac were banned from the roads? No, most people would have to walk. Most people can't afford a Cadillac or a Maserati or something of that quality, a Rolls Royce. So. It's the same thing with doctors. Which is it better to have uh, no doctor at all or a, or a Chevy doctor? Chevy doctors are pretty good. The Chevys will get you around. They're pretty safe. In any case, this is a rationalization. It's, it's not correct. First of all, in order to become a doctor, you have to be a citizen. And what the hell has citizenship got to do with being a doctor? You, you can take care of people if you're not a citizen. Secondly, you have to take an exam. Well, that's reasonable. Who could be in against an exam? The problem is the exam has to be in English. And a lot of doctors are qualified but can't speak English. I have to tell you this wonderful story about my PhD. In order to get the PhD when I was there, you had to have two languages. Thank God they allowed you to take math instead of one language. Now it's down to one language. And I took Spanish all through high school and all through college, and I hardly knew a word in Spanish. But they gave you a dictionary. Spanish English Dictionary, and they gave you all the time you wanted, and you had to translate a Spanish paragraph into English. And after, you know, two hours, I figured out what it was, and I made perfectly good English sentences, and I passed. While I took this exam, two Mexicans also took it, and they failed Spanish, <laughs> because they couldn't make a good English sentence to save themselves. So I used to tease them for years after about how much better my Spanish was than theirs. So. So I'm sort of biased against language exams. I believe, you know, we should have interpreters and specialization and division of labor, and not everyone has to know every language known to man. In any case, uh, the argument for having doctors speak English is, you know, you go in there and you say your elbow hurts, and they start operating on your knee, and <laughs> you, you don't want that. But the arguments against that are, first of all, there are unconscious patients. You don't need any language because they're unconscious. They can't talk anyway. Secondly, there are translators. Thirdly, there are other patients who speak the same language you do. Right? Let's say you come from Korea. Well, you can only speak Korean. Well, you could take care of Korean patients, couldn't you? And yet the law precludes you from doing that. And if you took care of Korean patients, there'd be fewer patients for other people. The, the wages of doctors would go down. Uh, this is a very powerful thing. During the time 1928 to 1933, not too many Jewish doctors came over here from Vienna. And in those days, the best doctors in the world were Jewish doctors from Vienna. But in 1934 to 1939, tons of them came over here. And yet the number of new doctors in the medical roles in the United States was the same in those five, two five-year periods, which shows that 
All these doctors were not allowed to practice, whereas economists and physicists and mathematicians came over from Vienna to escape the Hitler menace, and they were all added on to our roles, but not doctors. Okay, so one argument is that doctors uh, are precluded from entry, and as a result, doctors make from two to three to four times as much as PhD biologists. Why do I pick on PhD biologists as a comparison? Because I figure if you get a PhD in biology, you can probably be a doctor. And if the salaries are five times higher, this indicates to an economist that there's some sort of restriction on entry. Okay, the second reason for uh, high prices, oh, before I get to that, so how would the market deal with the quality problem? The market would deal with the quality problem not by having licensing, if you don't have a license you can't practice, but by having certification. Certification means, if you, like a CPA, if you're not a certified public accountant, you can still be an accountant, but you're not as well thought of. So you could still take tests, and there was this case of the uh, thalidomide drug, which was a morning sickness drug, and the FDA approved of it. And later on, you had birth defects. OK, look, to error is human. There will always be mistakes in certification. The point is that certifiers, like the FDA, who make a mistake will tend to go broke. But certifiers who do a good job would continue. So I think that certification would get us better quality doctors, not just more of them, but better quality. OK, the next cause of the high price is demand inefficiencies. The first was supply, now we're talking about demand. Look, if we did the same proposal with regard to healthcare as, as with, with milk, suppose we did the same thing. We said, look, milk is too important to be left to the market. Babies won't have milk. Therefore, we have to have a price of zero of milk. Right? Right now, kids have water gun fights. We have super soakers. What would happen if milk were free? You'd have milk gun fights. <laughs> right now, people take baths, and what do they use? Water. But I understand that milk is good for the skin. So you take a bath in milk. So you, you would waste stuff. And that's exactly what happens here with medical services. Uh, you know, you're a um, hypochondriac. Socialized medicine is great. Oh, doctor, come help me. Uh, well, you have no friends and no one will talk to you? You go to a doctor and he'll talk to you. So we have needless waste of medical services and then we have long lines, uh, waiting lines. Uh, anyone ever see the movie Moscow on the Hudson? It was uh, just an indication of what the Soviet economy was. In the Soviet Union, if there was a long line, you got at the end of it. You didn't ask what it was for. <laughs> You just got at the end because it's toilet paper, pickles, who knows? You just get at the end. Well, that's what we have in medical care is Sovietization. The third one is medical malpractice. Medical malpractice, depending upon the specialty, can range from 35000 to 200000 a year. 200000 a year pushes the supply curve to the left. It makes medical service very expensive. Why do we have that? We have that because... Doctors are not allowed to contract with patients to say, look, I'll do my best, but if I leave a scalpel in your stomach, you can't sue me. You get it? Right now, if you leave a scalpel in someone's stomach or they, they don't like what happens, they sue you. Uh, uh, child, uh, people who uh, uh, help women take babies, birth, whatever it is, uh, the baby uh, doesn't have blue eyes that you wanted, you sue the doctor. So if we were to allow contracts where the doctor didn't have to guarantee any success but just to do his best, we would then cut out those costs. If we, see the point is, do you really want to leave something so important as medicine to the people who provide post office services and motor vehicle bureau services? I mean, that, these are the people, this is the government. So in conclusion on this medical service, what I want to say is that if we straighten up the supply and the demand and the contract, we would have very much lower prices. And if we had very much lower prices, you could have insurance for, um, you know, uh, horrible diseases, which would cost very little, and the whole problem would go away. And the summary for the overall point about uh, socialized medicine and drugs and um, uh, body parts markets is that the free enterprise system works best 
It's the most moral system, and medical care is no exception. Thank you.